And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Matrix Ghost Games and the creator of the occult cyberpunk game known as Chromatic Shadows, the one and only Christopher Headley. How are you doing today, man? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Um, I, I want to just preempt this by saying that I, I had to rock a little bit of Enigma on YouTube prior to the, uh, prior to the interview just to kind of get in the proper mood. <laughs> um, because, you know, that's listening to a few of your pods, that, that was definitely one of... One of the one of the benefits, one of the perks was, uh, you know, uh, those those eight minute uh, like trance Gregorian chant um, uh, tracks, and you know, hopefully I, I will be uh, lucky enough to have an introduction like that. <laughs> so I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Oh, sure. Well, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Role playing games. Oh, that's that 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 goes way back. Um, that goes back into the the days of like pre consciousness. No, um, so I, I played I played D and D when as a very young kid, um, and my father uh, had the the Moldvay cook. Uh, basic expert boxes and I, I think I was gosh I must have been like four or five years old and I and I, I saw those things just kind of hanging around the house and you know he had a co-worker uh, a co-worker at his office who was into medieval studies and they would get together and, and just play some D&D &D every now and then they weren't very serious about it but those books those Errol Otis you know the covers and the art just totally mystified me as a kid and uh you know i would just like i would read them obsessively and i you know i didn't understand any of what i was reading i was just like you know just transported by like how mysterious it was and just how cool all the art was um and how weird it was so i would beg to play with my dad you know i you know i could barely read at that point but you know he he would uh you know, he would humor me. Um, uh, yeah, I, I remember uh, making uh, a character uh, as a very young kid. I, I had a halfling, uh, and um, I think his name is Frodo, <laughs> original. And uh, we played we played that little stock dungeon in the back of uh, Basic, and I think I died in the first room. So that's that's how that went. But uh, it stuck. Um, and, you know, for a while I didn't play, I played mostly through high school and, uh, you know, I put it down for a few years during college and picked it back up in my, uh, my like early twenties. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been playing all sorts of different games since then. So with that in mind, how did Kermit, how did the idea to jump into full on designing happen? Oh. Especially um, with chromatic shadows. I guess accidentally. Um, <laughs> um, well, I guess I've always been, I, I would say for a few years before I actually started writing chromatic shadows in earnest, I was tinkering with... Uh, a number of different ideas. Uh, you know, I had quite a few projects I was I was working on. Um, nothing really kind of gelled. Um, you know, I took them pretty far, but and you know, I'd write adventures and I'd I'd have kind of half baked ideas for larger product projects or like campaign campaign worlds and things like that. Um, but. The, the real impetus for Chromatic Shadows was probably, well, I would say directly born out of just my experience of playing, of, of looking for a cyberpunk role-playing game that 
kind of fit for what I was for what I wanted for uh I I a lot of it was kind of <laughs> I, I I'd say a lot of it was sort of born out of frustration with playing Shadowrun. <laughs> I mean I guess I guess I I have to start there. Um um and house ruling that game um substantially and just realizing that you know the house rules were sort of like becoming something you know something something different and and just kind of pushing that along um and just kind of letting that kind of grow as you know my my interests were changing and you know my vision for the game was changing i mean it was a it was a it was a process i mean it took me from beginning to end from from where i started to where i am now you know probably somewhere you know close to about four years of uh tinkering and writing and rewriting and and uh you know really formulating the the clear concept of the game and then buckling down to write you know to doing the design and doing the editing and and all of that but you know there were there were some there were some late changes that were pretty fundamental to the uh uh you know to the themes of the game um you know i i i thought i was pretty far along and then and then i kind of hit had this little sort of crisis and i had to pivot pretty hard and change things and uh, i'm really glad i did because i think it's a lot more interesting um you know i think it it stands on its own more now than it would have had i not done that i'm gonna keep going <laughs> for what it's worth even even in um when it comes to the concept of wanting to wanting to do sh do shadow run but some but something that fits with what you want to do and house ruling your way into a into a whole new game yeah. you are in good company on both fronts right um, there's there's been plenty well, good i was kind of a late comer to shadow run um you know I, I played i read almost all of the books all of the editions with the exception of fourth edition i, I didn't really read fourth very much but I started playing at fifth edition, and uh, you know, and and uh, that was that was that was a bit much for me. Um, there was a lot, you know. There was just a tremendous amount of uh, like spreadsheets I had to write, and you know, I had to like just have all this stuff like written out, and you know, at my fingertips just to kind of like you know do the basic stuff of the game. Um, and kind of what I wanted to do with the games that I was running the, was run it a little bit more off the cuff, more sort of character driven, little like more like a White Wolf game, more like a like Vampire, uh, which I have a lot more experience playing. Um, and I'd, I'd say that that's kind of like my default mode of like, you know, urban style RPG. You know, that's kind of like it's that's that's kind of a, a comfort zone of mine vampire you know i've been playing that game on and off for like 20 years so um you know approaching like a cyberpunk game i was like oh well, you know maybe maybe there's a way or maybe there's a game out there that you know has that kind of like flexibility you know that uh, you know and kind in kind of like um some of that character driven kind of play loop um and you know i i think that those um, concerns sort of motivated some of the design decisions for writing Chromatic Shadows, for sure. Yeah. Um, I sp I sp the big one that I, d that I definitely noticed is is um is the fact that you can you kind of answered that you kind of answered one of the things I've I've been picking on Shadowrun for years about, and that is that despite the claim that it I that it is a free, that it is a free form affair when it comes to character creation in practice it is not like yeah, yes you can ha yes you can ha you can in theory have um do it have any sort of potential character as long as you can pay up in karma but in reality 
There's always going to be somebody who's the street Sam. There's always going to be somebody who's the hacker. There's always going to be somebody who's the mage. There's always going to be somebody who's the face man, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Those archetypes are kind of like baked in, you know. Even like you said, I mean, you, you know, you can build your character how you want, but I mean, those are kind of the, you know, the the archetypes that tend to support the the, the game as it's played, you know, and you know, you can build away from those archetypes as, you know, as you want, but, you know, most of the time, you know, your characters are sort of aligning towards those those ideals. You're right, yeah. So, uh, you know, so with Chromatic Shadows, I mean, I, I sort of took that and, and, you know, I just kind of, I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to have roles as, as part of the game. You know, I... I, th I there are these very classic cyberpunk um, roles that you'll find in a lot of c cyberpunk games, and you know, I I, I opted to go with slightly more hard coded character classes. Um, uh, you know, that there might be options in the future to make that a little bit more flexible, but um, yeah, I I I I, I was I, tr I tried to lean in a little bit into that because I think that's um, that that to me I, 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 there were there was there was some like um, I was thinking a little bit about like old school D and D and how the the character classes uh, you know the the distinction the differences between the character classes are complementary and how they, and the composition of the party really becomes the toolkit for solving problems. And that was something I really wanted to bring into Chromatic Shadows, where, whereas like, you know, you're, the, the, the roles of the characters are, are a tool that you can use in a very specific way to solve a problem. So depending on your, your, the composition of your, your, your party, you're going to be dealing with a situation in a totally different way, depending on who's in the group. And um, you know, I really, to me, that's really exciting and interesting to see the difference in how uh, you know it plays out with different groups, you know, dealing with similar situations. And uh, um, I I'm trying to get away from you know, design where everyone can do everything. You know, I, I want there to be sort of coded incentives for difference between the characters so that those differences can, you know, sh shine and differentiate, you know, in, in play. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with Freeform, but it does have the, pr it does have the price of analysis paralysis, and that's something that any designer has, t has to, on some level, account for. They can't get rid of it, yeah. but at the very least, they can minimize it. From what I saw with what you're doing, it's more the roles are more like a archetype, a, a starting package of sorts. Yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's um, there's not a lot to it either. You know, there's not like there's a, a progression. You know, it's not it's not a level based game. It's uh, it's levelless, and you build up skills and you build up your attributes. And you can build up, um, you know, certain certain of your like occult powers, um, but the classes themselves are fairly minimalistic. And uh, you know, as your character gets more experience, they're obviously going to get better at what they do. But you know, there's a, there's a lot of room for like lateral growth in terms of uh, just buying different skills or buying different gear, getting different cyberware and, uh, you know, exploring the, like, you know, your, um, your strange attractor and, and the different the sort of occult powers that, that the characters have. That's a whole other sort of aspect of, of, of the design as well. Yeah. One other thing, I, one other thing that stood out to me is the whole concept of Neo tribes. Of, try oh, yeah. of attempting to put in proper fa proper factions. Okay. Yeah. Even which um, in a roundabout in a roundabout way, the way you have the neo tribes set up, the Borgs, the 
the Ferals, the Paladins, and the Satans. Um, yeah, it yeah. Kind of, There's more coming. There's it, a number of. It, I have a, a lot of other ones like on deck. You know. Yeah. But, it uh, kind of reminded me of the, of the way of the in, of the theming that happens with the gangs in Night City in um, Cyberpunk 20, 2020 and Cyberpunk Red. Okay. More yeah. Than, more than okay. the factions in say Shadowrun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that is that just co well, is that coincidental on my part, or was that a bit of an influence? Well, I mean, I really my my knowledge of Cyberpunk twenty twenty is pretty cursory. I mean, I've I've never played it. I've I've browsed through the book. I have Night City. I've looked at it. I love the maps, but I'm no like expert on on it. Um, uh, influ in inspiration for the Neo Tribes came from probably from like. Uh, like William Gibson novels, you know, some of some of the gangs, you know, they're probably lifted from his books, you know, into these games. Um, uh, also, uh, you know, I was, you know, th maybe there was some influence from like vampire clans. Um, you know, there was, there's just, um, I, I wanted, I, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know if I had, I had like a, a particular thing I was patterning it off of. I, you know, I, I'd like to think that that idea might be one of my more original ideas <laughs> in the game. I know it's certainly not like a completely original idea, but um, it's it's. I, I think it it by sort of bringing that aspect into the foreground a little bit by foregrounding that as as like a character option that you can you can take. Um, you know, I think it it creates a little. You know, the, I, I think I think it adds something to the to the game world. You know, I think it adds like a little bit of distinction uh, to the textures of the of the game, to the textures of the world and play. And it's been really interesting because the, you know because the book, the basic book, you know, doesn't really get too deep into the lore of the Neo Tribes. And so I've really let in the games that I've played in the playtesting, you know, I've really kind of let the the players kind of go wild with defining the parameters of what these neo tribes look like, and it's pretty remarkable, like where we've gone in some cases. I, you know, I have I have one guy who's uh who played a Borg, you know, and and uh, <clears throat> and this guy, you know, he he decided that you know he was the leader of this Borg community that lives in this like reclaimed you know uh, like suburban uh, enclave like Burbclave, and you know it. And it's this whole uh, kind of like um, uh, autonomous zone, uh, you know, the suburban autonomous zone that's just been reclaimed by all of these neo tribes, and it's it's kind of like this patchwork quilt of these these this kind of like anarchist community of of neo tribes, kind of living side by side. You know, there's this kind of sort of understood truce between them, and uh, it's just. The, the the kind of hierarchies that he's kind of come up with within Borg culture and and uh, and the motivations you know uh, has been really pretty cool and it's become this like uh, ongoing feature of the game you know that we kind of keep going back to and revisiting and uh, you know maybe that's something we could eventually develop into a printed thing but. Um, You know this this idea that um, the you know the like you know that that the, the outlook you know and and I and I think you know when I when I've when I've talked to players about it um, you know I, I I think the thing that I just try to um, impress on them about like choosing the neo tribes is is that you know that it's 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 a real their their philosophy is is not. Our philosophy, you know, they they have this, the, the almost uh, you know a slightly alien outlook, and their their social conventions, their social norms are not, you know, they're not they do not conform with the normal conventions of society. You know, they are they are like their own thing. They're this insular group that, um, uh. You know that follow that that follows their own customs that has their own you know sort of iconography of symbols and um, their own 
you know, way of dressing, their own way of living, and and just kind of exploring that and 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 watching that sort of evolve has been pretty cool. Now, one other thing I did want to focus on is the f is the fact that unless unless I'm mis unless I'm misreading things, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the skill system, for one, there's far less skills than you'd see in something like sh something like Shadowrun or even Cyberpunk. And two, I did not I did not see okay. um I did not specifically see what different types of weapons as their own skills. Yeah, right. So weapons weapons are fairly simplified uh as far as the skills go mm -hmm. um you know there's 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 a firearm skill there's a melee skill there's a brawl skill and then there's uh i believe there's an electronic skill um or a mechanic skill i, I forget which one it is uh which would be utilized for something like explosives mm -hmm. um and there's athletics too that you can that you would use for uh, like ranged attacks like bow and arrow or missiles or grenades or something like that so the the um, you know if you want to there's skill specialties though so um, if you are if you want to you know be a sniper or something like that you take your skill specialty in sniping and sniper rifle or something like that and that's going to give you you know some extra that's going to give you like extra dice um, for for that you know sort of narrow category of 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 uh, of firearms, so that's that's kind of like I I did not I, the the general hmm, like approach was to not to make things you know not over specify the skill system keep things as 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 simple as I could without you know without oversimplifying, um, but I there's there's quite a lot of flexibility within the special within skill specialties so and there's a fairly broad way of interpreting what that what that could be you know i'm not um you know i'm not looking to like you know define the game in this you know ironclad way you know i want i want it to be fairly um you know i, I want there to be a fair amount of interpretability and flexibility in how in how it's and how you can and how you can play, and um, you know I, I one of the benefits of of at least that I've seen at table in in simplifying things this way. Um, I mean, if you want to call it simplified, is is uh, that it just generally moves pretty quick combat. Um, combat can get pretty, um, you know, pretty tactical, but it's, it's not, there's not a lot of, the mental overhead for combat isn't, you know, too burdensome, um, even when there's a lot of moving parts, you know, like you can, you can, like my last game, I think we had about nine or ten. There was a big combat at the end of this adventure, and there was about nine or ten combatants. There was three NPCs. There was four PCs. There were six adversary NPCs. Three drones. One character hacking. You know, one. You know, one. You know, he was. He was. There was like controlled drones on the ground. There was a lot of moving parts. Um, and there was very little like rule book diving that we had to do i mean it was there was a fair you know we had to do like quite a lot of like oh well do you have line of sight do you have cover relative to this guy you know like you know what exactly are the rules for grenades um but you know we managed to kind of like get through a fairly complicated and tactical combat with without too much lag and and i think you know i think that's speaks to kind of the robustness of, of, of the system on one hand, and also that, you know, I think there's the, this, this streamlinedness, I guess, of it is, 
at least for me, it's kind of like where it's kind of like my happy place. It's kind of like the sweet spot that I was that I'm like I'm looking for in cyberpunk. You know, like I I I like a certain amount of tactics. I like you know um, I like there to be interesting complexity on on the battlefield, but um, too much can get too bur- can get overly burdensome and 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 uh, you know that's you know so I'm, I'm I'm trying to find this kind of like middle place that works. You know what I'm saying? I lose. No. No, Discord just decided to be a dick. Okay. Um, you've referred oh, to yeah. Chromatic Shadows as a cult cyberpunk. Um, and I'm, yep. cu- I'm curious. What, I'm curious what that enta- what that entails, and how does that separate from, from say the the cyberpunk fantasy that, um, something like Shadowrun is. Okay. Yeah. So. Um. The. The the whole okay um, the whole frame of of chromatic shadows is this um, is that the characters exist within this um, this occult world this this kind of like haunted sprawl where there are. Like, how can I? Okay, let me let me back this up. I'm sorry. Um, the 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 backstory the backstory of of Chromatic Shadows in in a nutshell is that um, that there was this this event called the Shadow War. Which was essentially a a rivalry between um, megacorps uh, over the the acceleration and, uh, and, and 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 like cr- creation and acceleration and and and, and research of these um, these like occult assets. Okay, that's what they're called in the game. These occult assets. So uh, in in secret, these these um, megacorps were developing um, these various technologies, um, you know, with you know in these in these secretive bunkers and these black sites, you know, with the cooperation of uh, you know cultists or uh, you know there's you know the possibility of like alien technology or supernatural influence or interdimensional influence but the bottom line is that there was this this whole secret program of these these things being developed and there was a whole culture of um like hired mercenaries anonymously you know kind of you know the classics you know, runner kind of um, trope, mm-hmm. uh, infiltrating and trying to disrupt the rivals, trying to like blow up or steal secrets. You know, shut down the rivals' um, operation. Um, so there were these, you know, so everything had to be really, really secretive, and there had to be these layers of secret, you know, redundancy. And um, of course, you know, the the motivation is that. Uh, you know, whoever can develop these things and bring them to market the first, you know, the soonest is gonna is gonna be uh, on top of the you know on top of the game. They're gonna be they're gonna win. You know, the 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 motivation for the mo- megacorps to do this is like purely profit. You know, there's no uh, there's no like higher <laughs> you know philosophical like purpose other than just like pure venal profit. And but in doing so, they have to drag a bunch of weirdos into their orbit so that they can, 
you know, they can sort of do this thing. You know, there's they need to have like a whole body of specialists on retainer to be able to, um, you know, to, 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 to know, to have any idea of like what they're doing. Like, what is, what is this technology? You know, there's like weird alien uh, like fragments from from the moon you know they're trying to like m make it do something you know you know we need to we need to bring in like specialists we need to bring in occultists we need to bring in you know all these different you know these these scientists that you know supposedly know what's going on mm -hmm. um so anyway so like this whole shadow war goes on for a number of years and then it kind of blows up with this catastrophic event um this tragic event happens where a lot of civilians die as a result of it and the consequence of that is that these corporations get found out and that they go bankrupt you know they get exposed publicly and they go they 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 crash and burn and that's the the collapse you know that's that's part of the setup of the game so there's this collapse event that happened like a decade prior to the the events of the current timeline and um with the collapse comes the um, the abandonment of these black sites, you know. So all of the occult assets that were being developed in secret uh, are completely just left. They're like these, you know, they're left behind by the technicians and by the scientists. They're literally like breaking them up and just like fleeing for their lives. They're afraid of getting found out. Um, you know, they have no loyalty to these people that, you know, are now you know, obviously, you know, criminals, and that there are these layers of uh, redundant secrecy, so, you know, so there's no one, you know, so that now, now that the lines of communication are broken, no one is going to, you know, there's no one out there who's going to come looking for it, because no one knows where it is. Mm -hmm. So, so you have, like, you have a situation where there's, like, hundreds of these, like, bricked over sites with all of this weird stuff just kind of like percolating in the sprawl okay and that's kind of the setting where the the characters kind of come into play you know and and all of this this weird stuff is influencing things in in this kind of subtle way you know so the so the occult thing is like it's subtle it's not this it's this it's this like it's this creeping sensibility you know it's this it's like it's just twisting things in this in a subtle weird way um and the characters kind of interface into this situation because they they have a stranger you know they have a strange attractor which is basically that each character has had this formative experience in their lives that has like opened their eyes to the reality of the occult world you know they've had this event that you know has left left this mark on their you know on their beings that they can't ever unsee you know they've they've like and that you know so so they've they know that there's weird stuff out there and on one hand like it makes them kind of not fit in with the rest of society because everyone else is kind of ignorant and on the other hand they're you know they're 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 kind of obsessed with it, you know? Um, they want to know more. They want to kind of, like, go down the rabbit hole, even if it's a little self-destructive, you know? So that's... But, you know, they can't... You know, they have a hard time fitting in because of this this, 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 um, this experience. And the experience has also, like, caused a little bit of, like, a weirdness to kind of rub off on them. Right, so each character has this resonance with the occult world. Like, whatever experience that they had manifests in some small, subtle, like, aura of their of their being. You know, like, depends on what it was. Like, you know, let's say you maybe had a, you were, you know, attacked by some kind of monster or something like that. You might have some kind of like sympathy for these, for like for for monsters. You know, you might. You know, get like a weird tingling in the back of your neck when one of these things is around, or you know, you might, you know, have this sort of like unconscious um, ability to like, you know, fi you know, f seek them out. Um, and that's and and each each strange attractor that you know the character can choose, you know, during character creation, you know, has has like a has like a passive symp uh, sympathy that's always on, 
and there's like an active sympathy that can get more that gets more powerful you know as more you know more um experience well, more, more occult milestones are sort of invested into it um so like you know the characters have this strange attractor they're a little spooky they're a little obsessed mm -hmm. um and that kind of is the vector that brings the the characters together you know they can kind of like relate to each other in the party because each of their teammates has had a similar kind of experience you know they're carrying this weird uh you know tr trauma or whatever i get you know whatever it might be um and you know maybe they don't it's not the same thing that the other person had but you know they at least you know they're sort of bonded in knowing that this other person understands that there's like something weird going on mm -hmm. so so that's that's sort of how the characters play out but um you know after the the corpse collapsed um just revisiting these the other you know like like i said previously the, the mega corpse had to draw in a lot of sort of outside specialists as advisors um to kind of do the do what they were doing to kind of like accelerate all of these these occult technologies you know they they relied on this infrastructure of other people um advisors and specialists and and other weirdos to like sort of drawn into their orbit and after the the collapse of the megacorps you know those people didn't go away you know they they were privy to all of this inside information they saw what was going on behind the scenes and when you know all the bosses you know got taken out of the picture they they didn't go anywhere you know what they did is they went out and found each other and so the kind of like those people kind of realigned into what's what 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 it would become the factions all right so they become these sort of smaller power brokers you know within within the scope of you know the occult world um and and so you have a number of these factions that are their own have their own kind of niche interests and their you know their own sort of philosophy and goals and um but you know they're all kind of competing with each other and and they're all definitely all interested in getting their hands on these different occult assets um for different reasons you know but um so that's that's kind of um that that's kind of where the, like the factions sort of come into play i mean not all of them are comprised from the collapsed you know megacorp infrastructure but a, a number of them are there are some other ones that are like uh you know there's like a, there's one group that's kind of like um like the resistance like a resistance cell you know and they're and they're kind of um you know they're they're it's called sentinel and they're all about kind of fighting back against the occult threats and they're they're like one of probably the the most sympathetic faction out there you know they're they're interested in like protecting people fighting you know fighting against whatever you know threats might be out there um and then you know there's some like real scary factions like the the hegemon that are like you know going to come into a situation and silence everybody and you know um that have a lot of funding and you know are uh, you know um anyway yeah so that's that's kind of the Destroyed. Yeah. Now, one of the other th one of the other things I was I was curious about is there. Whenever it comes to cyberpunk games, there is one particular avenue that seems to spark a whole lot of endless, endless arguing, and that mm, is okay. hacking. Oh yeah, cool. Ha, ha ha. Yeah, one of my favorite subjects. Yes, <laughs> hacking. Because <laughs> this. Because a lot of a lot of because people either really like a system that ha that I've I've yet to see I've yet to see a case where somebody outright really likes a ha a hacking system within a, within a given game. At most, it's yeah. tolerated. Did you read my Did you read my hacking system? 
I did, but for the sake of the audience, <laughs> well, could you get could you give the skinny as to how as to how your how your approach came to be? Oh man, my approach came to be through <laughs> like uh, through a lot of trial and error, through a lot of like engagement with play is how it came into be. You know, I, I had a lot of ideas on the table that, you know, w once they made contact with with a with a player. <laughs> they did not they did not work at all um and I, I i realized that so much of what is kind of the assumed some of the <laughs> some of the sort of like uh genre assumptions of uh, of hacking and cyberpunk just are not necessary for it to be fun as a matter of fact they they i i think they like interfere with a little bit of fun um so I, I I think like I had I had to like well all right so I, I mean I in in certain respects my hacking system still is kind of like fantasy computer hacking it still has its like yeah there's nothing wrong with that the yeah it still pays its homage to Gibson and and to like early Shadowrun and stuff like that but. You know, I really, I tried to cut the fat, and I tried to get rid of what seemed to be redundant, you know, like, a character wants to do a thing, and like, well, how, you know, how do we get to the thing, and have that be interesting, but also a challenge, you know, how, how can there be layers of um, difficulty and escalation and, and, and interest, and even still, like, a little bit of, like, tactic tactics without making this totally burdensome so um i mean i think it i i think it it's i think my system as it stands is okay i think it's pretty good actually i like it i, I like it so much that i can't look at <laughs> i like it i mean right now it's probably my favorite hacking system <laughs> so i mean you want you want to know what it, how it works I mean, it's, yeah. it's there's cyber there's cyber decks. I mean, there's two stats on the cyber deck. There's uh, there's processing, and then there's hardening, and processing is like a bonus that you would get to like hacking attempts, and hardening is pretty much like uh, armor that kind of shields your deck from getting fried by ice. Um, so the idea is that. Uh, Kind of like the fantasy computer system in my in my game is is this this conceit that there's this thing called like uh, virtual code that um, you know virtual reality and and like DNI direct neural interface mm -hmm. kind of created this revolution of uh, like programming where you know it's like programming code becomes this like three dimensional like iconic language this very complex thing that that is rendered through a neuroimmersive uh, environment mm -hmm. um, and can only be, you know, which makes it extremely resilient to being messed with. Like, you need to really be a hacker to, uh, to like, m mess with the works. It's very secure. Um, but the other hand is, like, it also will fry your brain if you're not, if you don't know what you're doing. So, like, right off the bat, like, the hackers... It's a, the assumption is that the hackers are, you know, skilled enough that they can navigate this sort of environment without risk. But anyone else who jacks in, you know, can can really hurt themselves if they're not if they're not if they're unlucky. So, um, so the idea is that um, you basically need to access a node. Um, and you can access a node anywhere. Uh, you know, there's there's no real limits to the to where you need to be in order to access a node. You need to you need to have a hard connection to uh, to a telecom line in order to do it. So you can't you know just just because the amount of data is so so much, you know, you can't do it wire. You can't hack it wirelessly because it's just you know, it's just too much. You know, it's just you know <laughs> there's just no way. It's just too com It's just too much too much bandwidth. So. Um, you need to make like a direct connection, and uh, you know you, you're kind of you you kind of enter into this sort of um, 
AR environment where um, you're not like in a virtual, you're not in like a a shadow run matrix space. You know, you're 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 still like kind of in the world, but you are like immersed in this in this like augmented real this heightened augmented reality feed. Uh, you know, just like vir just kind of surrounded by by the, in this environment of virtual code that you can interact with. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea is that um, you, you know, once you've like spoofed your way into the node, um, you can access the, the the inner workings of the node, and and it, you know, in in doing so, you can download data, you can change a, a program, you can you you can uh, you know like. Uh, manipulated a device that's you know that's like slave to the node you can um, you know do anything that you can basically think of you know in terms of you know accessing the um, you know the vital functions of a particular site because um, you know the 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 nodes of the of the world are these kind of like just you know like sites are like sort of tied to these discrete nodes. Um, so uh, there's ice that you need to contend with in order to uh, to 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 do anything. But with the ice, the ice is like the ice is like um, it's 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 like an equivalent to a barrier in combat. So it, it becomes like almost like a threshold that you need to beat in order to interface with um, with the node. So like there's there's it's like um, you know it's like defensive you know it's like a defensive layer of like uh, um, of code that can hurt you that um, and if you don't exceed the value of the ice you know like you have to make a roll um, you know, this game uses dice pools, d6 dice pools. You have to make your roll, and you know, dice that meet and exceed the ice value. You know, those those dice are applied, you know, against against the node. And you know, you can reduce the night the 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 ice by like beating its value. So you know, you, and and once the ice is beaten, you know, it's it's pretty much it. It can regenerate, but generally speaking, it it um you know, it, you're gonna buy yourself a lot of time by by beating it. Mm -hmm. And so once you know, once the ice, once you've sort of bypassed the ice, and I mean, you can still you can still influence the node even if there's ice there. It's just going to be more difficult. And you know, if if you fail the roll, the ice hurts you. You know, it's going to cause you know damage to your deck, or it's going to cause stun damage to you, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, you know, once once you're actually rolling against the node itself. You know, you need to beat the node's dice pool in order to do the thing successfully. And um, you know, if you fail, if you fail the roll, um, you escalate an alert, an alert clock. And uh, you know, a three, and you, and the alert clock has like, you know, three steps. And after the third strike, uh, you're out. You know, the alert sounds, and you're dumped from from the node. You get kicked out immediately. You get a point of shock, and uh, and the node goes offline and notifies its uh, its admin, and uh, you know you're you're out of luck. So, but there's a, there's a lot of workarounds. Like you know you can you can reverse the alert. You can, and then there's this whole other element of of play where hackers are able to um, you know they have these 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 special uh, daemons, these these like little independent programs that they mm -hmm. they get as part of their class description that they can. They can kind of plug into their deck, and they and they do all sorts of cool little things. Like, um, you know, each daemon can like break the rules in a little in a different way, and you can slot, you know, as many of those little modules into your deck as, as the deck is strong. And um, so, depending on if you have some forethought and you know you have a little time to prepare, you know, you can kind of like load out your deck in a certain way. And go in and you know really take care of business. Mm -hmm. So, with the, with that in with that in mind, um, 
Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it, do it does. And one of the thing one of the things I was curious about is is a common problem that can that can end up happening in a lot of cyberpunk games is the is when it comes to hacking sequences it ends up turning the game into a duet between the GM and the hacker because mm. as much as as much as in theory a lot a lot of those kind of games are for, are free form um, there's usually mm -hmm. only going to be one person designated as the hacker that's just how these things yeah. kind of work yeah. okay um, has that kind of thing hap happened in your setup or does does the node system end up going too quickly for that problem to occur? So you're asking me if it if it just if, if in the in the context of hacking if it becomes like, um, you know, if the game kind of like grinds to a pause and it just sort of like becomes a situation where it just becomes all about the hack. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, that's kind of what I mean by a duet. <clears throat> um. I mean, it it it, it can, um, you know, that most of the time where where I've seen a lot of drag is where like the rules aren't clear and things need to be explained and uh, but the mechanic wise, I don't think it moves any slower than than combat. Like I had we had a scene. A couple of sessions ago, where um, the the car the party was split. Uh, oh, another another thing is that with the hacking, the way that I have hacking set up, there's a couple cute little things. Like for instance, like you can toggle uh, in and out of um, you know in and out of the grid. Mm -hmm. So like if you're jacked in. You can just kind of, you know, as a like a free action or a minor action, you can toggle out, and that doesn't break your connection. It just, you know, it just so you can like function with the rest of your party. You know, you're not, you're not locked into this like catatonic state. You know, you're you're still fairly mobile, which, you know, is is I think is cool. Um, and even when you are hacking, you're still you're not completely immobile either. You can still move. I mean, you're totally distracted and focused on the hack and you know, in this neuroimmersive environment, but you can still move. I mean, you're still aware of the environment, even though there's this whole other world sort of layered on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess just by way of example, we we had a scene where um, they were, the, the party was infiltrating this, this mansion out in um, the Fortress Estates. And, uh, you know, half the party was circling around, you know, through this hedgerow like kind of rolling up on this electric fence, doing some recon, and the hacker was, you know, at the bottom of this cliff next to this, next to this lake, uh, you know, in, you know, hacking the grid. So um, we were jumping back between, you know, between scenes, or you know, we were in, you know, we were, we were just kind of like jumping back and forth between the, the characters and what they were doing, and 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 and. Uh, and he was in there. He was trying to. Uh, he was trying to do something. I don't remember what it was exactly what he did, but he screwed something up. And there was there was like this um, this kind of like rampant AI entity that was like in the node that was alerted to uh, to his presence because he like made this mistake. He like kind of like you know he 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 he. he, he he made a mistake. He he like escalated the, the the alert by one step, and in doing so, he you know he kind of like drew the attention of this this AI entity that was like sitting inside the node, and this thing kind of came at him and attacked him, and it turned into this like cyber combat um, situation where they were kind of dueling it out. Um, while the rest of the party was you know, carefully creeping up on this fence, doing recon, you know, try, waiting for him to disable the fence so that they could move in and, you know, infiltrate this, um, you know, this, uh, this utility, um, this utility uh, building where they're, you know, trying to do something. Um, and I, I was noticing, like, how fluidly we were moving between the, the combat 
you know, the cyber combat and then what was happening on the ground. And, like, there there wasn't a whole lot of lag. That It was kind of like... Um, it was there was a you know the mechanics were a little different but you know the 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 speed of what we were doing there was very little difference like we were able to resolve all of that at about the same rate as we were able to resolve pretty much any other like combat action or skill test or something like that so mm-hmm. um, you know I don't I don't think there there I mean aside from it just there just being like a fair amount of like complexity in what you can do like as a hacker the mechanics themselves don't like um I I don't think they're overburdensome in in the sense that they take any extra time than anything else in the game I I think they're 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 fairly streamlined in that sense yeah I mean you can you can certainly like spend a lot of time like trying to figure out what to do but you know, resolving the thing is pretty quick, I'd say. Mm-hmm. The the other thing I notice is that when it comes to both um, lethal and str- and um, strain, not not strain, sorry, old habits, um, stun. Yeah, there yeah. isn't the escalating penalty that you might that you might see, and I'm guessing that was one of the one thing that, in your experience with Shadowrun, you weren't a fan of. Yeah, I wasn't a fan of that in Shadowrun. I'm, I, you know, it, I mean, that's something the Vampire does and World of Darkness does. It does like this sort of like um, the death spiral mechanic, mm-hmm. where you know you have like a, a health track, and uh, you know you get one or two points down, and your dice pools start diminishing. Um, I, I, you know, I that was one thing I I, I opted out of like very early in the design process. Um, it took me a while to come to the stu- uh, to the uh, the um, the shock mechanic, but um, so essentially, you know, in- instead of like tracking some kind of like esc- you know, like um, like these these like incremental penalties based on you know like um, you know you're whittling away of your health. Um, it, it, it kind of works in these chunks. So, like, you know, when your stun track is reduced, reduced to zero, like, you have to make a like a like a body test or a, rather a will test. I think difficulty three. So you need to roll your your you need to roll dice equal to your will your willpower uh, at a threshold of three. And if you fail, you fall unconscious. Um, but I, I you also gain a point of shock, um, regardless of. Um, of, you know, whether or not you fall unconscious or not. So, like, shock becomes, like, this kind of all-purpose um, mechanic for dealing with um, those kind of situations, I find. You know, the, the shock mechanic um, is, is pretty flexible because it can be applied... It can be applied for, like, physical strain... It can be applied for, like, mental and emotional strain. It can be applied, you know, as part of, like, the damage that maybe, like, some kind of, uh, you know, entity might inflict. Um, so essentially what shock is, is it's a, uh, it's, it's a, you have your shock track, you have three points of shock, or you have, you can gain up to three points of shock. And uh, each point of shock that you accumulate causes, like, uh, a, a, a negative uh, to your dice pool, so up to uh, negative three. Or yeah, I think at, at, actually I think at three points of shock, um, you know your uh, something bad happens. I think you gain no at three points of shock you get you lose an ability score. That's what happens. You get an ability score damage and then shock resets. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm guessing, you know, is it a, is it is it the case where? Um, it's three. Stri- it's three strikes. You're out when it comes to shock. Um, I think it's. I think like once you hit the third point, you're out. So yeah. So three strikes and you're out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I try to use like the three strikes and you're out thing. Like that. That seems to be the comfortable mechanic. You know, I I've used that a few times in the game. It seems to be just kind of like a, a comfortable way of doing things. It's easy to remember. Mm-hmm. Now. But yeah, that's how that works. Yeah. Oh. Incidentally, I did. I do appreciate that you 
you kind of took a page out of White Wolf's um, ha habit at the bottom of the character sheet. Oh, just put, just putting, oh, yeah. just putting a quick re just putting a quick reference for um, for de derived um, derived abilities and uh, advancement. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That I mean, that saves me so much time <laughs> when it's just when I'm creating characters. You know, it's like the amount of book diving that you know trouble that that saves me is uh you know i that um I, yeah i'm glad you noticed that because i i was hoping somebody out there would appreciate that thank you yeah i've i've always had i've always had a play play by the sheet attitude and um but it doesn't surprise me that um that not, that people you that um people ended up using mr gon's um custom sh custom sheets that had more stuff in them to the point where oh, yeah. Onyx Path just cut out the middleman and hired him directly. <laughs> did they really? Well, it's, it's, what, it's it's what they it's what they did for the more recent stuff. Um, because because his because um, I don't I don't mean to be too harsh, but a lot of those a lot of the character sheets for the old White Wolf games, yeah. kind of sucked. Like yeah. like it was a it was a one page thing that might work when you're starting out, but as you progress in the campaign and get and get more and get more abilities um especially yeah especially things like gifts which are going to have their own sets of mechanics yeah um that one page isn't going to cut it anymore no no yeah you you get into like the four four page sheets eventually yeah it gets, stuff gets pretty crazy mm-hmm and um, I, I know, I know. Some people say that that four pages is too much; that you should only need one or two. Um, yeah, that is entirely dependent on the game. Yeah, well, you know, if you're a wizard, and you're playing D and D, you need more than two sheets. <laughs> you're, if you're playing a wizard in D and D and D, eventually you're going to need all the sheets. Let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, the, uh, you know the guy who the guy who's got like third, the guy who's got like. Um, like 300, 300 different spells, and is and somehow saying, "There's nothing wrong with this. This is perfectly balanced. Fighters aren't supposed to be powerful." He says as he's casting Meteor Swarm for the umpteenth fucking time. No, I'm not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bitter. But with the now with that in with that in mind, um. Something that something that I am I am curious about is if you have plans down the road for some for um for put for putting in mods when it comes to weaponry. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I have I have plans, right? I have mm -hmm. uh, I have I have some plans about where I'd like to take the game. Um. um the uh, the the basic rules that I released that you have um, is you know is kind of a, a, the result of a pretty dramatic editing process. Um, you know I, I've start I started with a document that was substantially bigger, and I cut things way down. Um, you know to arrive at you know a game that I I thought was full and playable, but also um, uh, you know not not full not not complete like there's there's um a number of like th things notably absent from from the basic rules that uh that m my plan is to go back and kind of like build on you know you know i i think part of the impetus for 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 um for the for developing the basic rules was that I, I kind of I needed to focus on on finishing the thing you know I, I, I wanted to finish the game I didn't want to wait for, I didn't want to take forever to do it I needed to kind of constrain I needed to like put some constraints on myself in terms of like and and like like a, a time frame on myself for like getting getting the project done because you know I've, it's been something I've been tinkering on for far too long and you know, I was like, well, what you know, what's the, what's the minimum expression of this game that's that's good and and, and playable, and you know, I can I can put out into the world, 
and this this is where this is what I, I arrived at. I think I think the basic rules is playable. I think it's you know pretty robust little game in and of itself. But you know I I, I want to take it into a much longer version of the game. You know I have plans to do um, something that's you know between two to two hundred fifty pages in length um, with a lot more lore. Um, a lot, you know, quite a few more mechanics, and part of that would be, um, you know, expanding equipment, weapons, cyberware. Um, but as you can probably, as is probably obvious by reading the book, that you know, it's there are other cyberpunk games out there that spend a lot more time and effort on the gear than me. <laughs> Um, I mean, there, there's a fair amount of equipment um, in the book, but, um, you know, it's, it's not overly emphasized. And, um, and maybe that's just part of me, like, um, you know, I mean, part of that is just, you know, a result of the editing process. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you know, I'm not... I'm, I'm like, I, I think there is a certain amount of like option paralysis when you put in like a hundred pages of equipment, and um, I guess I guess I didn't want the equipment to be the the primary, um, like, it's definitely not like thematically the most important thing of the game. I wanted it to be there. I, it's it's impo you know it's important for the characters to be able to like access the special powers of the cyberware, but. Um, you know, it's not... I don't think it plays thematically as big of a role as it does in a game like Cyberpunk or Shadowrun or something like that. I think it's a little bit more low-key in Chromatic Shadows. I, I, can cer I can certainly see that. Now, with that in mind, what, what would be some of your future plans for, for the... For, um, a cult, for Chromatic Shadows? Okay, yeah. So, um, well, I just released an adventure. Uh, the first adventure for the for the game it's called the Emerald Aurora, and that's out that's out on Drive Through RPG right now, um, and that's a 35 page adventure. Um, it's it's a pretty cool like um, it's 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 a mission based uh, adventure that that's very like um, sight focused. You know that's uh, you know it kind of like puts the characters in. Uh, you know, puts them on on the the trail of trying to recover this occult asset out in the slags, which is kind of like the industrial no man's land, the sort of liminal, you know, zone of the sprawl. And um, you know, so there's there's like these kind of cool open um, sites for the characters to kind of explore, and um, some really interesting factional stuff for them to to get involved in, and some pretty like kind of like spooky stuff eventually you know there's like um it definitely kind of leans into some of the uh some of the cosmic horror um themes toward the end um so um so that's that i think i think that presents a real challenge for the players and you know i'd be really curious to see how how people deal with that if they eventually um you know try try to play through the adventure um but beyond that, I mean, I've got a number of other uh, adventures in the pipeline, but I think what makes the most sense for me to do is, is um, and, I, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about this week, about, you know, the next, where to go next. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be, like, a lot of, there's going to be, like, print-on-demand uh, options available through drive through You know, um, the, the basic rule book is going to be, Print on demand through drive through, and you know probably later this week it's going to be available. So if people want a uh, like a nice print copy, it's going to be it's going to be available. Emerald Aurora is going to be is you know the proof is in the mail. You know probably by the end of the week or early next week that should be ready to go. Um, but as far as like the next big um, project is, uh, I'm I'm really starting to explore the possibility of developing this this large core rule book uh, with everything in it and uh, maybe 
launch a, you know, maybe kickstart it. You know, I'm thinking about, I'm kind of exploring um, crowdfunding right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I, I, go ahead. No, you, please. I can, I can certainly get behind that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? I mean, um, I, I, I feel like there's a little bit of interest right now, um, you know, and I, and I don't want to, I don't want to wait too long. You know, if I, if I wait too long, you know, um, people are going to move on. They're going to forget about it. But if I, if I move straight into this project, you know, maybe I can kind of, uh, you know, capitalize on a little bit of like a little bit of interest that I've, I've, I've generated so far. It's, you know, there's, there's been like a pretty good response so far from people. Um, um, but you know, it's only been a couple of months. I think it came out in April, the end of April. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I, I, this, this, this core rule book, um, I'm looking at something between like 200 to 250 pages, you know, a hardback, uh, and it would collect everything that's in the basic rules, but it would add you know, about a hundred extra pages of 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 lore, of, uh, of of mechanics. So we would see things like, um, you know, like like a timeline of the Shadow War. We'd see things like, um, you know, descriptions of of you know uh, of, of like the the history of the certain key pieces of technology in the world that you know these formative pieces of technology that have like influenced things we would see things like more neo tribes probably more backgrounds i'd like to introduce like a few more like origins maybe a few more professions uh you know do a little bit more tinkering maybe with some of the roles uh i've got um you know a whole chapter on vehicles that i'm i'm excited to uh, to put out um, with some really cool like um, pursuit mechanics, um, uh, and the factions. You know, a, a long chapter on the factions. M more more about like occult adversaries. A big chapter on occult assets with um, you know. Ra random tables to be able to create occult assets, you know, the tools to be, uh, tools to, you know, tools to help you design them and and then a number of pre-made occult assets with uh, uh, story hooks and uh, you know, mechanics and story hooks and ways that you could like plug it into plug it into a to a campaign. And then I have this other idea that I, you know, I, I, on my blog, I, I put out, I have a lot of random tables that I've created over the years. And, uh, I would, and I, I have this idea of having an appendix at the back of the rule book that would just be a lot of, um, there would be an expanded version of that. A lot of, a lot of random tables and generators things to cr to sort of populate sprawl zones um, to to generate um, like plot nodes um, I, I, I like the idea of um, using random tables as a As a way of like creating the the fiction, the, as a, as a way of like um, describing the um, you know the world. To me, that that breaking everything down to these little discrete data points that can be rolled and freely associated together. To me, that's that's. That's a lot more interesting than um, reading a chapter that explains, you know, <laughs> the history of something in, you know, in, in, in you know, in, in all this exposition. Um, 
And I think it's a lot more useful at table because your characters might make a detour into this part of the city and you don't know what's going on. So you just grab a couple dice and roll and all of a sudden you have like this this new scene that you can fit contextually into what's going on and maybe something will happen there where that, that you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. The, the, uh, I really, I love, like, introducing elements of surprise and chance, um, into, you know, into these, you know, in, into, into an ongoing story and, and just seeing how that kind of, um, evolves things outward. There's, in unexpected ways. Um, anyway, that's that's. I I, have, I I would very much love to be able to just kind of spend a lot of time writing tables <laughs> in the back of the book, and maybe uh, maybe coming up with like a like a kind of a, a setting like or, or or like a little like chunk like a little map at the end or something like that that would be you know, like oh this is this is a piece of the city that you can. That you can you know use uh, you know as kind of like a like a home base type deal you know like because mm -hmm. I, I that that was that was one um, question that quite a few of my players brought up you know over the course of playing is like well what is this world you know where are we what what is you know what what's going on contextually you know what's the political situation where you know what part what country are we in what's that like um, and a lot of that. A lot of that stuff I've left kind of intentionally vague, you know, hoping that individual GMs and tables can kind of fill in those details. But um, I think providing a map, you know, just like a small, like, uh, it, you know, something that would just sort of show, in, you know, my vision of like how all this stuff sort of fits together and then use it how you will and I mean, use it or don't use it, make your own. But um, I, I can see how that that would probably be pretty helpful for someone to just yeah. pick up and, and play with. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how th how things develop going forward. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, and, you're very welcome. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always Ooh. open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I, I drank some uh, peppermint tea, so um, but now it's all gone. <laughs> uh, no, thank you so much. I really, um, I really you know, enjoyed the conversation, um, and uh, it's it's always it's always great to have the opportunity to to speak at length about this project that you know I'm, I'm passionate about, and it's really. Good to talk to you and to, to get to know you a little bit more. So thanks for having me, and um, now hopefully we can do it again. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, monk.